Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, guys. Stacy with me. Shalawama. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about the Feast of First Fruits. Okay. The next feast on the agenda after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm -hmm. And in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about when it is, but we're going to focus primarily on Leviticus chapter 23 and what we are supposed to be doing on this day. Okay. Now, we did get some new revelations working on this class, so I would advise people to stick around to the end where we'll also ask for people to share their testimonies around the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay. What did they learn? You know, do they have any revelations or any new ideas or any new ways that we're supposed to be doing it or anything that they would like to share with the rest of us? We'll, right. But we'll talk about that more at the end of the video. Now we want to look at a comment from Amico. Okay. This, this kind of prompted this video or reminded us that we needed to put this type of information out. So we'll go ahead and read his comment, if you would. I am really confused about first fruits. I see so many people celebrated it on the 9th. And I can see why it would make sense to celebrate it on the 14th. So would our celebration of weeks, Shavuot, change also if we celebrate it on the 14th? Also, we aren't supposed to eat bread until we have a wave offering. What does the 50 days mean then? We have 50 days to make a wave offering, and until we do that, no bread. Do we also celebrate first fruits if we were unclean the first month and the second month? Now, right there at the end, he's talking about the people who will be doing second Passover. Right. The ones who were not prepared in the first month will have the opportunity to do Passover in the second month of the sacred year. And they will also do first fruits. That first fruit celebration will also fall at the end of their Feast of Unleavened Bread. That they'll do in the second month. Okay. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. The first thing we're going to look at is this confusion over the date on which the festival is supposed to start. Mm -hmm. Now, we've covered this in several videos. Right. We got whole videos on the Feast of Pentecost and first fruits and when all of that takes place, proving verse after verse. Mm hmm but just so they have something to work with we'll show a few of the verses like for instance over in the book of jubilees chapter 15 where in the first verse we see that abraham celebrated the feast of first fruits in the middle of the third month mm -hmm. that's important when it's talking about the middle of the month there we see this also confirmed though when talking about jacob in chapter 44, when we see him celebrating the Feast of first fruits in the middle of the month. You see in verse 1 where he offered a sacrifice on the 7th of the third month. And then you see in verse 3 where he remained another seven days, taking us to the 14th day of the month, where we see in verse 4 he celebrated the Feast of first fruits. Right. Well, this is important to note because many people celebrate Pentecost on the sixth day of the third month, the sixth of Sivan, which is not actually the middle of the month. Right. Well, this is because they're actually celebrating Easter instead of Passover. Mm -hmm. Their sixth day of the third month falls 50 days after Easter. So, in other words, they're force fitting Pentecost around. Easter and in doing so they're actually changing the date right. of mm -hmm. first fruits and Pentecost that's what they mean by the fourth beasts will change the laws and the times he's basically changed the feast day the whole feast of Pentecost he's moved the date by one week in order to make it reconcile with their Easter celebration in order yeah in order to justify their Easter celebration but anyway, like we said, we've covered that in many videos. We can give links to them at the end of this one or in the description or somewhere. Right now, understanding when the Feast of First Fruits is supposed to take place, we're going to look in the book of Leviticus chapter 23 at the verses to tell us what we are supposed to be doing. Okay. Matter of fact, would you read verse 9 and okay. 10? Okay. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, 
Then shall you bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Now, there's a lot going on here. Like we said, we got some new revelations about this day. Mm -hmm. And this is some really important stuff because we have been struggling with this for many, many years. I know I have been struggling since the 90s on what exactly we're supposed to be doing on this day. Okay, the first thing I see is when you come into the land. Well, yeah, and that's going to be important here. A lot of people who will take this literally in this time that we live in now will recognize this as the time after the pole shift, after the great earthquake, mm -hmm. when the earth is humbled and everything is made even again. People will inherit the earth. They will inherit this land and they will start growing their own food again like they did back in the old days. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is saying here. When this transition is made, when we get this land and we start growing this food, this is a harvest celebration. And he's telling us how he expects us to handle this harvest celebration. What does he expect us to do? Is the key words of that which I give unto you? Yeah, because that's one of the things there are people will focus on. Like I said, these are people who will be taking this literally thinking about land terra firma that we could put our hands on while other people will be thinking spiritually. And so it'll take on a whole nother meaning mm -hmm. as far as this land and when he when it is that he actually gives it to us. I, this kind of reminds me of my 2015 testimony around tabernacles when I read that verse down in about verse 39 where it's talking about after you had gathered in the fruit of the land mm -hmm. and i read that literally having not gathered in any fruit of the land decided not to do this festival day sleeping in booths like it talks about yeah I and that. i believe that was an error mm -hmm. i believe the literal interpretation actually made me make a mistake that year and not do what i was supposed to be doing as far as waving these palm branches and things okay but anyway, we'll come back to this verse as it's talking about the sheaf of these first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let's look at verse 11. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, here we're talking a little bit about the date. It's talking about the day after the Sabbath day. Right. This is the date after the Feast of Unleavened Bread has been completed. And this is one thing that we have to understand is that the way the pagans calculate Pentecost will actually have two festival days falling in the same week. Mm -hmm. Well, this one actually starts after Unleavened Bread is completely over, which is this Sabbath day. It's the morrow after, which is the 23rd day of the month that they are to wave the sheaf offering. And when you're talking about um, how they celebrate the feast in the same week, you're talking about they are literally celebrated within the same days back to back or stacked on top of each other well actually you have in the year 2023 the feast of unleavened bread starting in april the 6th and the resurrection sunday worshipers will do their feast of first fruits on april the 7th but you notice that that is in the middle that's actually the second day of unleavened bread mm -hmm. so they're celebrating unleavened bread and first fruits on the same day right. the thing about it they're contradictory the feast of unleavened bread we're told we're supposed to eat unleavened bread for the week mm -hmm. and what we're going to find out about first fruits is that we're not supposed to eat any bread mm -hmm. so there's a there are contradictory okay. in terms you actually can't celebrate both on the same day mm -hmm. So it is on this day that you're actually supposed to wave a sheaf. So what is a sheaf? And a sheaf is kind of like a small cluster of the fruits or the vegetables that you're growing. Okay. For instance, here they're talking about grain. Mm -hmm. And so they would have been talking about wheat. Right. But here in the spring, March, April is actually too early for wheat. Mm -hmm. You actually only have the little shoots that are coming up out of the ground. Yeah. So what they're being told to do is to grab a handful of these little young shoots of wheat mm -hmm. and bring them to the priest to wave before the Lord. Basically saying, Father, we're growing wheat out here and we want you to bless it. Right. So they're bringing in these little sheaves and waving them so that they can be accepted, hoping that they will have 
an abundant harvest come Pentecost time. Right. Because of that, that's when the wheat actually be ready to, 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 to make the bread and stuff. Yeah, it's definitely not ready yet. Um, I was telling you about how um, we saw some wheat uh, growing in the in someone's pasture um, the other day, and it's definitely green and definitely not ready to be harvested at this time. Well, and that reminds me, this is the sabbatical year, so technically there's not supposed to be any wheat growing out there at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that lends to the idea that, that reminds us that we have to find the spiritual meaning behind this, else there's nothing to do as far as this verse is concerned in a jubilee year or a sabbatical year. There's nothing to wave. Okay, so what would be the, I guess, spiritual sheath that well, we wave. Well, we learned in the Third Testament of the Bible, and I don't have the verses here, that when he's talking about our land, he's actually talking about our ministry work and what we do as far as cultivating the kingdom of heaven. Makes so sense. there's some relationship there between the land and his flock, his church, his people, and our interactions with them. Okay. But like we said, there's some more Bible study to be going on there. Mm -hmm. So praise our Father in heaven. We have a little more time to figure this out. So let's go on and let's look at the next verse. And you shall offer that day when you weigh the sheep and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Okay, now what does this verse mean to you? Um, it seems to be talking about a sacrifice offering. I guess of the of the firstborn of a um, male lamb. Mm -hmm. The firstborn male lamb belongs to our father, and this is exactly why I thought you should participate in this class because this is one of the greatest misunderstandings of the church, and one of the things that I personally have struggled with the most for the past almost thirty years. Oh. What is it that we're supposed to be doing here? Okay. Is saying that we're supposed to offer this lamb mm -hmm. on first fruits. Right. But notice I asked you what did you think of it. Right. And you said sacrifice. I did. But it doesn't say sacrifice. It doesn't. It says offer. <laughs> right. So here is the confusion in the church, I believe. We have been taught that this word meant sacrifice. Offer. When actually it's just saying to offer. So what... So yeah when I hear the word offer my mind immediately goes to um, to offer up a sacrifice exactly but that's two different things you're offering a sacrifice so you have a sacrifice which is your lamb mm -hmm. and you are offering it what it's not telling you to do is sacrifice it right or kill it or do anything else to it we we'll come back and look at the Strong's at 6213 to make, do make. Mm -hmm. And you can see some of the other words used in its place like bear or bearing, mm -hmm. made, or make. So an offering is not necessarily a sacrifice. No, they're offering the sacrifice. Whose job is it to do the sacrifice? The priest. The priest. But this is not talking to the priest. This is talking to everybody. Uh oh, that is true. It says, "Speak unto the children of Israel." Yeah. And then you look over in Leviticus twenty-three, when it's also talking about these festival days. How it says you're never supposed to show up at the festival empty-handed. Right. You're always supposed to bring an offering. Right. So what this is saying here is that after the feast of Passover and unleavened bread, the people are ready to make this offering, and they're being told to offer a lamb without blemish. So you can imagine, you have sheep, and so you've gone through this feast day, Passover, unleavened bread, and now what you're being told to do is to get one of your firstling lambs out there, one of your firstborn lambs, that lambs out there, and actually bring it and offer it to the priest, to the Levites, mm -hmm. who will later on use it as a burnt offering. Unto the Lord. So you will present the priest your offering but he doesn't necessarily make that sacrifice with the offering that day. They had to make offerings, I think, two times a day, every day. Right. And so this is where they would have been getting these animals from, is us. Yeah, it would be like in um, 
They will have it set aside. For they that would, purpose. We would bring it to Jerusalem to them during the festival day, or, or to the neighborhood priests wherever on the festival day. We would all bring our lamb. Each one of us will bring a lamb down there to him, and then he'll keep them housed up until he needs them for his temple work. So us, all of our job is to offer it, not to sacrifice it, and that's where the confusion comes in, because there are some translations. Mm-hmm. That says sacrifice. That says sacrifice instead of offer. But sacrifice is a whole nother word. And so we've been confused thinking that our father is somehow telling us to kill this lamb. So have we been getting in trouble by doing it wrong? Or now that we know the correct way to do it, I know that we proceed by doing it correctly now, but... What is the cost of doing it wrong? Just losing blessings. You're not being a nobody's being held accountable for our sin right now, and that's what should be noted. Nobody's being held accountable for our sin. I mean, you think this, today is the Sabbath day, right. but if you listen, you can hear people mowing the grass and chopping down trees and doing all kinds of things. And tomorrow they're gonna be living just as happy as they were today. Nothing's gonna happen to them. It's only after this pole shift, after this tumbling, after this celestial bell goes off and the world is changed to the kingdom of heaven, changed to the new age, changed to the new environment, then will we be expected to live under these rules and these laws? And if you don't, then you're just simply going to perish by attrition. You're mm -hmm. just simply not going to know what to do in order to survive and you're just going to die of natural causes. Right. It's like you won't have the favor of the Father upon you because you don't know how to observe the laws. Yeah, that cleanliness laws, dietary laws, all of these things we take for granted. Now, one day it's going to get us in trouble. You better know what foods to eat and what foods not to eat because they're not always going to be prepared properly. And sometimes they might have parasites and stuff that will kill us. Well, if you don't know which foods to look out for, then you're subject to eating the wrong thing and perishing. So my point is that we're, nobody's being held accountable to these rules. This is all a dress rehearsal as we get prepared for the great and terrible day of the Lord and afterwards when we're expected to live in the kingdom of heaven and abide by these rules. We are just the first fruits. Mm -hmm. That's why we're trying to study and learn now. We are the first fruits who are preparing, but it is after the pole shift that the rest of humanity will expect to know all of this stuff and prayerfully by then we will know exactly what to tell them. That's why we're doing these Bible studies. You know, giving this information out to the public so they can share that in the comment section so that we can have a mind meld come together so that when it is time to present this information to the pagans, to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world, we are all on one accord. We all know what we're supposed to be doing, know what we're supposed to be saying so we can also worship in the same way on the same day. Right. But anyway, let's go on to the next verse. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hand. So here they're being told to offer mm -hmm. flour and wine. Right. Wheat and the fruit of the vine. Right. Those are key elements to our Father's festival days. Lamb, wheat, wine, and what else is there? Right. Bread. Mm -hmm. You know, those are our key elements. Basic to our food. Those are the things that we need. Right. Oil. Well, what they're being told here is to offer this. These are things that the priests would have needed, not only just for, um, you know, the daily sacrifices, but I would think so as far as his provisions, you know, to live upon. Yeah. The priest is not expected to work like the rest of us. Right. You know, he is expected to spend his days in the scripture. That is his work. Mm -hmm. You know, he that is a big job that he has to do day in, day out. On top of the scripture, while the rest of us are, you know, watching football and soap operas or whatever, he's in the books making sure we know what we are supposed to be doing, when it is that we're supposed to be doing. That's his job. Well, who's paying him to do that job? Right. Well, 
us. Mm -hmm. We are given benefits in our agriculture. We're given lamb. We're given wheat. We're given wine. And Mm -hmm. we're given oil. And all we're expected to do is take a tenth of this Mm -hmm. and present it to him on the festival days. To offer it to him. And some people do it weekly and you know when they get it they offer Mm -hmm. some people would wait till the end of the year and you could imagine you know all of these offerings coming to the priest during this time and like you said that would have been his provisions for the rest of the year that's Mm -hmm. how our father set this thing up and so i looked it up um and a hen of wine basically is about a quart of wine okay and a tenth deal of flour is about a gallon of flour. Right. So this would have been an offering. A lamb, a gallon of flour, and a quart of wine to the priest. Very smart. That's very <laughs> smart how the father did that. You know, because uh, like you said, we read in the book of Leviticus how, you know, we're supposed to provide and take care of the priest. And this would just be provisions for him and his family. These are the tithes and offerings that our father requires of us. This is what he's talking about over in Malachi chapter three, when he's saying, will we rob him? Mm -hmm. Well, you can imagine we're getting all of these blessings. And instead of giving the priest his share, we're just keeping them for ourselves. Well, that's actually stealing. And so now the priest has to go out and actually put the scripture down, you know, Come out of the tabernacle and go and get a JLB. Instead of learning these scriptures. Now, getting down when it starts talking about Pentecost. You see, then you offer seven lambs without blemish. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're talking about here. A multiplication of your resources. You don't went from seven as mm-hmm. a wave. You don't went from one as a wave offering mm-hmm. to now you have seven. Wow. But anyway, let's look at verse 14 because that's a whole nother festival. 14. And you shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Now, this one also has been an area of confusion. Okay. Because of this days that you're not supposed to eat any grain at all. You remember last year we went 50 days without eating grain. Yeah. We did. <laughs> I think we lost weight and everything. Yeah. We eat a lot of bread around right? Well, well, I think what we learned was all of the foods that include grain. That that was what was surprising. We wasn't ready for all of the foods out there that actually have grain in it. Yeah, corn especially. It was just surprising how much grain we eat when we had to get it all out of the house and couldn't eat any of it. Right. Well, I'm not sure we actually did that, right? I was hoping you were about to say we're not going to have to do that again. I don't want to. I will, but I don't want to. All right. So what we've been talking about up here is an offering, right? Right. Lamb, flour, oil, wine. wine. Mm -hmm. But look what it's saying down here. It's saying that you are to go without eating any bread or parched corn until you make that offering. Until that offering is made. So you come all the way back up here and you have the wave offering. Right. That's what you're going to do today. Right. That you're going to bring. But now that you've made your wave offering, you now understand that you have this other offering to make. Right. And you're given some time to make it. But the thing is, you're not supposed to eat any grain or parched corn until you actually make that offering that you're required to make. Hmm. So you're not supposed to go 50 days. It's just as long as it takes for you to do this. So you didn't came down to our festival and you didn't enjoy the Passover and the unleavened bread. And here you are on first fruits and you just find out you have an offering to make. Well, how long is it going to take you to go home and get it? Right. You know, well, let me read 14 again. It says, and you shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears. We know it's talking about grain there. Until the same day that you have brought an offering unto your God. So that that makes sense. And then you look at verse 15. It's changed gears on us. Mm -hmm. And it's actually going on to start talking about counting towards Pentecost. Okay. So they're unrelated. 15 and 14 are not 
related. Right. So it's not saying to go 50 days without bread. Right. It's saying hurry up and make this offering. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what it seems to be saying. So where where did the confusion come in at? Because there's a separate offering on Pentecost. And since we're not used to making offerings in the spring festival, everybody's just waiting the 50 days to make the Pentecost offering instead. So to sum it all up, we're basically presenting a wave offering of our resources to the priest so that he can wave them before our father asking that they would be blessed. Mm -hmm. And then we're making our spring festival offering. Right. Um, our tithes and our offerings that we're required to make on every festival day. Well, turns out we do that on first fruits mm -hmm. and the spring festivals. And then for Pentecost, during the summer festivals and tabernacles in the fall fest. Okay. Well, we just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, this is a Bible study, and I understand it does include some new information that we really haven't heard of before. So we have to uh, kind of put our minds together and make sure that we are accurate. But while we're doing that, like we talked about earlier, maybe the people can share some of their testimonies over the spring festivals with us. Yeah. Did they, what did you, you know... What did you learn? What did you do? What were your activities around um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Have any dreams, any revelations, mm -hmm. any ideas, anything you guys can share down in the comment section. That's part of our first fruits is our testimony and sharing mm -hmm. with one another. It's right. very important so we can let everybody know um, what we have to offer. Right. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're going to close this video out. Shalom. Shalom.